Hey guys, it's Loman, and today I will be showing off my new nautical build clearing Shura 2. By no means is this the perfect nautical build, in fact I think it's pretty bad as a build, but it's something that I tried out based on a certain core concept that is VDP. And I will explain this more in depth on how it works, but for now what we'll be doing is first we'll be talking about nautical just for a little bit to see okay this is our strengths and our weaknesses and things like that. And then we will be going over the team build itself, how it was constructed and how it works, how does it like synergize and work together to beat sure to and then lastly i want to talk about the problems this build has on every floor and just in general all i want to say is it's not a good build it is actually kind of bad we'll go over that too so first and foremost let's go over nautical so if you have two over you have 2.25x hp you have 324x attack and then you have 2.25x recovery and a 75 percent shield so she has the coveted 9x effective hp that has made leaders like Saina and to a lesser extent ryume so popular now 9x effective health and recovery is not totally necessary the damage constraints on shura 2 for the most part i notice it's around 240,000 to 300,000 damage per floor. So if you're going to stall, that's about how much damage you need to tank and recover. 9x effective HP and recovery actually can go all the way up to like 600,000 effective health and recovery. So, so it's pretty strong in that department. It gives you the requisite survivability for the dungeon to just walk through it. When I look at Shura 2, the first thing I look at it for a leader is, can you survive in this dungeon? And if the answer is no, then I don't consider it. And now the code does have the requisite survivability survivability so she is a prime candidate for Shura 2. Now obviously there are other factors that make her such an excellent lead, in my opinion the second best behind Sena, but we'll get into those a bit later. Now Nadeko, she has three Takoyaki which gives massive personal damage and she has 7c, 10c and devil killer. Now the 10c might seem a little difficult but her leader skill also provides three extra combos when matching two wood combos and three extra combos is quite a lot because if you run two of her that means you get six extra combos and that means all you need to do is match four combos two of them wood and you're at 10 combos easily not only that but extra combos is also an implicit damage buff because the higher your combo count the more damage you will deal it's just naturally how it is so nadeko can trigger her own awakenings quite effectively her active is a cotton style orb change where you change one attribute in this case fire to wood change another attribute this time is water to heal so while it's not like a random orb generation that can overwrite hazards, like for example, Sena, And I'm going to bring up the Sena comparison a lot, mainly because that is Nadeko's contemporary in terms of leader skill power, right? Like her, her power as a leader. She compares with someone like Sena, who has been quite dominant <laughs> in recent times. So Nadeko has the active, the awakenings, and the leader skill. I mean, it's just a huge package. And... Yes, she is a transform card that requires 20 turns, but she also provides two skill boosts in her base form, so it really alleviates the transformation requirement. Now, if you notice, the only real requirement she puts on her sub is just being a wood attribute. And this is important because it's just wood attribute. Like you can use any wood attribute card. It makes her very, very flexible within the confines of one attribute. This allows you to have some creative team build one core mechanic that Endgame has revolved around since the days of A3, A4, is VDP, or the presence of Void Shields. The way they work is, if you deal damage above a certain amount, the Void Shield will just completely negate the damage and reduce it to zero. So for example, if an enemy has a Void Shield of 20,000, if you deal 19,000 damage, it'll go through. The shield won't block it. If you deal 24,000 damage, the shield will completely negate the damage all the way down to zero. Of course, this place is quite a constraint on teams because if your team does too much damage, then you can't really get through those spawns. Like if the void shield is 20,000 and you're constantly hitting for 200,000 on each sub, you're never gonna get through that shield, no matter how hard you try. So what can you do? There are a couple ways to bypass this. One, you can simply damage control under the shield. Now, this is actually more reasonable in recent times. For example, Shura 2, when you get to Gillies, 
damage control is quite reasonable because his void shield is exceptionally high. However, another way you can bypass it is through the Awakening VDP or DVP. The official name is Damage Void Piercer. So DVP is technically the correct abbreviation. However, VDP, I feel like just rolls off the tongue a bit better. How it works is you match a three by three box of a certain color, right? So in this case, Nadeko is wood. So if you ran a VDP sub for wood, you would want to match a three by three box for wood. Now, once you match that, you get this nice animation. And for any card with the VDP awakening, they get a 2.5 X attack boost for that combo and that card with the VDP so specifically that card so Nadeko doesn't have VDP so even if I matched a VDP she would not pierce however a card with VDP would pierce through once you match that box only for that turn why is this useful because VDP even though you can say it's purely intended as a utility awakening to bypass damage void shields the fact that it also provides damage is quite significant as now you can also burst through the spawn as well and you can use it for just more damage in general so in a way VDP has become quite nice with just augmenting damage as well as piercing through void shield. There is another method to bypassing void shields and this is with an active that specifically voids damage void shields. Now this active debuted with if I had to hazard a guess the first few cards that had this kind of active were Hal from Shaman King. You had Shelling Ford the light version and then you had a kind and basically what it does is it completely negates the effect of the shield similar to how fujin negates the effect of damage absorption shields and because damage absorption shields are so annoying fujin has become a ubiquitous nickname for that active effect alone anyway you have void void actives i call them void void because it says voids damage void shield so void void is just a nice way to say it i guess or you can call it a vdp active because it functions in the same way in terms of utility so you have void void actives that allow you to negate the effect of void damage shield for example if we go back to our 20,000 damage void shield anything above 20,000 damage will be negated now if you match a vdp only that vdp spawn will go through so for example if you have five cards without vdp and one with vdp and you match that box only that one card with vdp will puncture through now if it's a 20,000 void shield and it has very low health, that might be useful. However, if you pop a void void active, what happens is for that turn, well, depending on how long it lasts, all the cards on your team will be able to burst right through. Why is this useful? Before I delve a little more into it, void void actives in general are very, very unwieldy because they take up an active slot and that is usually a pretty big commitment in endgame. As you can see, I do not have VDP on this team. Instead, I opted to use LJ for my void void purposes. Why did I do this? The answer is because I wanted to try something different and also because I wanted to see how effective it was. Now, if you look at Nadeko, she has triple Takoyaki. So we have six on the team. Takoyaki have immense damage potential. If you match two wood combos, it already does quite a bit of damage but once you get to three four five that's when the numbers really start stacking up very quickly like the damage is actually ridiculous and so for me i'm thinking to myself well i can have all this damage but if I go up against the damage void shield spawn, it's all gonna get negated. Now, if I run a VDP sub, yes, I can use the VDP sub to puncture through, but only that sub will go through. Maybe I have two subs with VDP, only two subs will go through. If I bring along a void void active, everyone on the team can puncture through. And for me, I really thought that that would be the best way to do things because that way I could take advantage of Nadeko's immense personal damage. I could take advantage of Kukon's immense personal damage. I could just let everyone on the team burst through for all the damage that they have, as opposed to just camping around on VDP and making things go a bit slower. That that was the idea I had. And so I can use a void void active instead and algae is a nice choice to do it right because she's wood and she has a pretty short active and it, as you can see my entire team does not have vdp in fact i purposely omitted it because i felt like hey i really don't need it and also because it just ended up that like i couldn't fit it in the rest of the team 
is just bringing along utility that I need to beat the dungeon. For example, Yashamaru has the coveted cleric active that clears binds, awoken binds, and unmatchable orb statuses. So he is immensely valuable. I actually just really want to highlight Yashamaru because his active is so busted. <laughs> On ninth turn cooldown, he does full unmatchable clear, full awoken bind clear, full bind clear, and a board refresh. It's so good. For me, I look at this card and it came out in 19 too. And he's still so incredibly good. If I went back, I think he's one of those cards where you can just advocate to trade for. And most of the time, that's certainly not the case. It's very, very rare for a card to have value to overcome that deficit. But for me, I look at this card and I think to myself, this card is worth it at least to me now maybe i'm crazy maybe i'm wrong and that it wasn't worth the trade and that's perfectly reasonable right like maybe it wasn't worth the trade but to me i have used it so much like for example i rolled it i didn't trade for it i rolled it for my zella kitty team because he was just a superior option to odendra then when rainbow came around and grew really strong like let's say vi deal and new year reach was coming out at that time because he was released late 2019 early 2020 you had the new year seasonal and valentine seasonal and you got new year reach and then you got valentine's ideal so those were coming out and yashamaru was also really strong on those teams because he provided the perfect color coverage he provided great active and he provided good awakening so he was immensely useful on those teams and then that lasted let's see we had call of two then a6 then a4 so it lasted all the way till then now once shiro one and ultra one came out i kind of shelved them I don't really need him. Although, to be fair, if you look at his leader skill, he's quite fun. Man, uh, is this supposed to be a Nautico video or just a Yashamaru praise video? <laughs> Either way, the point is, he's really good. <laughs> so I'm using him. Um, some alternatives to Yashamaru. One alternative that I really like is Kamen Rider 000, the base form. He's actually really good. Um, unfortunately, he's not as all encompassing as Yashimaru is active so you're gonna have to figure out a way to supplement for like ogres or something but he's quite good you have Chaco. Chaco is actually really strong she has quite the active it's quite useful later floors but earlier you're gonna have to find a way to deal with some binds however Chaco is also another real replacement and she has quite the set of awakenings in fact she's the only one who you can opt for vdp the other two i think yashimaru has a super awakening vdp i don't think you really want to use that and kamen rider 000 you're probably going to default to the skill boost plus awakening because he only has one skill boost otherwise and that's just kind of a death knell for most transform teams so I was going off on Yashima for so long, but basically he's busted and he has only a couple of replacements. Now, moving on, you can see Bastet. Now, Bastet is actually quite nice because she has a very short cooldown, but she has the coveted time extend awakening, or not time extend awakening, time extend effect on her active that I was looking for. And the reason why this is useful is because on the earlier floors, there's three notable time debuff. You have floor two you get preemptively debuffed so your half time is half on floor seven you have the peng dress where your time is just reduced to like nothing for two turns and that's actually really frustrating and then on floor nine you get another time debuff so Bastet has a really short active that can take care of those time debuffs whenever I need. What I really like about her though is that since the active is short, I can inherit something on top of her. So most of the time for her, I inherited the Rough Itch and Flamber. It's basically a Kina Saros equip and basically it provides a three turn delay. The way it works is I use it on floor one to stall and then by the time I get to floor two, Bastet's active is up. So I use it to get rid of the time debuff. Then, I wait and charge it up as I go through the floors all the way to floor 8 to delay that floor because there's a lot of orb troll on that floor I really hate it and so I just delay to not deal with it. Now you might be thinking, wait, floor 7, you got Pengtros, how are you going to deal with those? Well, I simply just combo through. I basically pray and say, hey, I got to get good at comboing, I'll just make 7 combos and do my best. And that's how it works. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's risky for sure, but for me, it's a lot better than dealing with the orb troll on floor eight. Like I died quite a bit on floor eight running this team. And at that point I was like, I'd rather just, you know, endure two turns of just really fast comboing on floor seven and then just breeze through floor eight. And ever since I made that change to the build, 
it's run a lot smoother than usual. Finally, you have Kukon. Kukon is the shield option for the team. Basically, in the dungeon, you have three tremendously large hits that are really hard to deal with. One is floor five. You have the ogres where you trigger the super resolve and the red one hits you for 600,000 health. Now, unless Nadeko has 150,000 HP naturally, she won't be able to tank it. And in this case, as you can see, I don't even break 100,000 health. So I use Kukon to defend and save myself and not die. <laughs> uh, I also use it for floor 10 on Sun Quan. Although with Sun Quan, because Nadeko is wood and he starts out as water, like Nadeko actually kind of just one shots him. <laughs> yeah, it's it's actually not as big of a deal. Floor 13 on the boss floor for Gillies, if you hit him under 15%, he will awoken bind you, give you unmatchable orbs, and then he will hit you for 624,000 health or 624,000 damage and if you don't tank it you die so I use Kukon to tank it. Some problems with the build that I found is the void void active is a little bit annoying because you need to use it on floor 10, floor 12, and floor 13. Now floor 10 is Ganesha but Ganesha is just terrible on his own like you can one shot Sun Quan he's obviously the better option to get uh, Ganesha provides attribute absorb and all those things and it's just terrible to deal with floor 12 is Sherius and Sherius roots now you want to use the void void active for them as well because they both have void shield however from floor 12 you go to floor 13 and floor 13 is Gillies and Gillies also has a void shield now it's pretty high as I mentioned before so you can chip right under it quite easily but the thing is you have to stall for five turns because if you use it on Sherius to kill basically needs to entirely recharge once you're on Gillies and that's a little bit frustrating because it's a little slow but it is what it is the thing is if I'm damage controlling Kukon if you use it you need to make sure you're using it for that one turn the problem is Gillies has that below 50% move set that will kill you unless you shield it however because Algae's active is not ready because it has to charge for five turns that means I need to either damage control perfectly with Gillies or I need to wait for a long time now obviously i can safely just stall by targeting the blue pillar and whatnot but at the same time i'd rather get through gillies a bit faster so for me gillies when i'm damage controlling them like there's been too many times where i either try to damage control them and i don't deal enough damage so i have to wait for kukon's active to recharge or i hit him under 50 percent by accident and just simply die because I didn't use his shield. He's a great shield active and he provides great awakenings and all that, but in my opinion, he kind of sucks because you have to be perfect with your timing. Now, a better replacement for Kukon is Susanna, or he provides three turns of shielding, which means that if you screw up turn one, that's okay. You got two more turns in which you can comfortably damage control down. And so I think Suzano is a much better option. He also has great awakenings, carries the same super blind. And yeah, he, he's just absolutely amazing. So for that, I think Suzano is better. I didn't know how to incorporate him. I didn't try. I just used Kukon for this round. But I think in the future, I would use Suzano. I'm not sure if there are any other shield options. I didn't look too closely, but Suzano is definitely the one where you want to go with. Now, I didn't talk about Bastion that replacements but there actually isn't really a replacement for her so there's not much to talk about there best i think the greatest not the greatest the best compliment or the best replacement you can find is in a future collab called fujimi fantasia bunko very famous for his ranking texts like zealous and magic lin but also for its top rarities like the Alina Inverse, Guri, Orphan, Cleom. All of them are really strong with the exception of maybe Chidori. I don't think I've seen Chidori in a while. But yeah, it's a really strong collab. And when it reruns, and we are slated to have a rerun, there is a card called Constance McGee, who is essentially like a wood horse. He carries around the same active except it's for wood. So I call him wood horse. He is probably the best replacement for Bastet. But Bastet is also useful because she has that mass attack effect. And it's really nice on the first few few floors when I use her active because that way I don't even have to bother you know mass attacking normally by matching five linked I can just simply straight combo and her effect will just mass attack for me so it's actually quite nice in that respect so yeah those are the problems I think it's interesting and worth noting that you can build a team without VDP by taking advantage of a void void active and while LJ is certainly an expensive replacement it's possible it's doable so yeah I just want to point that out I think a lot of builds are probably focused around VDP by using like something like Albert or something. And that's cool. Albert's a great sub, but at the same time, I thought, you know, why not try this out? And so I did and it managed to work at some point. In the future, I may release another Nautical Clear 
but this time I'll be using VDPs for sure because I want to try that out too. It's just this one time where I tried out not VDP and it was kind of fun. It wasn't the greatest, but it was kind of fun. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed. I'll see you guys next time. Good luck and have fun. See you guys next time. Bye bye.